My name is Atul Shingare. I'm Associate Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School, Boston, and Staff Radiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. In this talk, I'm going to address imaging evaluation of incidental ovarian lesions. I have no relevant conflicts of interest. Ovarian cancer is the second most common gynecological malignancy. It is the leading cause of death from gynecological cancer. It's the fifth most common cause of cancer mortality in women, with more than 22,000 new cases and almost 14,000 deaths in the US alone in 2019. Majority of these patients present with advanced disease, and that means they have relatively poor outcomes. And therefore, it's important to detect these lesions early on. However, early detection is challenging because incidental ovarian lesions are very common. Depending on which study you quote, the reported incidence is 4 to 18 percent, and that depends on the population studied. Studies that focus on older women tend to obviously tend to have higher incidence. But vast majority of these lesions are benign. About 60 to 70 percent of incidental ovarian cysts resolve spontaneously. And that presents a management dilemma. Oftentimes, we don't know if we should ignore a lesion should be evaluated with let's say ultrasound or MRI or should we intervene send the patient to surgery and that leads to unwarranted variability in the management of these lesions. Sometimes there is over or under utilization of imaging. Sometimes it's associated with unnecessary costs, patient anxiety, sometimes procedures and therefore there's a need for evidence-based guidelines and on top of that we need to make some personalized decisions. For example, if a patient with advanced pancreatic cancer with meds everywhere come with incidental ovarian lesion, then it's not as important to evaluate that because patients as such have a very poor outcome. Usually, transfer ultrasound is the modality of choice for initial evaluation and MRI is the problem-solving tool. The goal is early detection of cancer without unnecessary imaging or surgery. Now, this was a recent example where this young woman had this bilateral ovarian cyst. Now, the radiologist could have been more confident in saying, okay, these are cysts, nothing needs to be done, but the report only said probable cysts. There were no recommendations for further imaging. But now the referrer, who was unclear what to do, asked for MRI, which was in this case completely unnecessary. So often we operate based on our experience or biases or preferences. Now we do have some consensus-based guidelines that we'll talk about in, in a little bit, but what we really need is high-level evidence that can be used to build these guidelines. Right now, most of the guidelines are based on relatively low level evidence. And eventually, hopefully, we'll have validated guidelines that we can use. So right now, we have Society of Radiologists in Ultrasound, SRU consensus statement for evaluation on ultrasound and ACR white paper for evaluation on CT and MRI. We are going to talk about this in detail. So SRU consensus statement. It pertains to ultrasound. It's based on three determinants of the lesion. First is imaging morphology. First, it tells us what are the normal findings, things that we should not be evaluating further. Then we have lesions in benign category, probably benign, or lesions that are worrisome for malignancy. Under benign, it could be simple or hemorrhagic cyst, endometrioma or dermoid. Probably benign is the lesions with thin septations, nodule without flow, where you think it's benign but not quite sure. And then lesions that are worrisome for malignancy, that is lesions more than 3 millimeter thick septations, nodules with blood flow. The next status is, next determinant is menstrual status and size of the lesion. Now using this, we are going to fill out this relatively complex table one row at a time. So on this side, we have the benign lesions, that is simple cyst, hemorrhagic cyst, endometrium and dermoid. Then we have probably benign lesions, and lesions that are worrisome for cancer. Then within simple and hemorrhagic cyst, we have age-related factors, pre- and post-menopausal. And then we have lesion size. So first, what are normal findings? Normal findings are follicles, corpus luteum, and any cyst less than one centimeter in size in postmenopausal women. So this column, for most part, doesn't really matter. So in a premenopausal woman, anything up to three centimeter, you just ignore it. That's probably just a follicle or corpus luteum. In postmenopausal women, anything up to a centimeter, we don't need to do anything. 
Anything more than that, we have to see how to handle that. Now, simple cyst. What are the imaging features of simple cyst? It's usually round or oval, like you see here. It is anechoic, smooth or thin walls. There's no septations, no solid components. There's posterior acoustic enhancement and there's no internal flow. Now, if you see something like this in a young woman, up to five centimeter, nothing needs to be done. Beyond that, depending on the size, either you get yearly follow-up up to seven centimeter or more than seven centimeter, you send the patient for MRI or surgery. In a postmenopausal woman, up to seven centimeter, you get yearly follow-up with ultrasound and larger than that, again, MRI or surgery. Now, next is hemorrhagic cyst. Now, it has reticular internal echoes. There may be a solid appearing area with concave margin because it's a retracted clot. There's no internal flow. When you see this again, up in a young woman, up to five centimeter, nothing needs to be done. Beyond that, you'll get ultrasound at six to 12 weeks, hoping that it would resolve. In a postmenopausal woman, you'd get follow-up to resolution in an early postmenopausal woman. Now, guidelines suggest surgery or at least surgical referral in late postmenopausal women. Sometimes that's a little bit too aggressive, but that's what the current guidelines say. Endometrioma. It has very typical imaging findings. Usually homogeneous, low-level internal echoes. There's no solid component. There may be tiny echogenic fossa in the wall. There may be mural nodule, because it's essentially a clot. Now, when you see this, you get ultrasound at six to 12 weeks, and then beyond that, you decide if you need to, if needed, you can send the patient for surgery or you can just follow it up yearly. Dermoid has distinctive imaging features, usually with focal or diffuse hyperechoic component, like we see here. Hyperechoic lines and dots, acoustic and shadowing, and there's no internal flow. Usually, these patients are either followed up yearly to make sure the size is not increasing or with surgery. Probably benign lesions, such as you think it's a hemorrhagic cyst or endometrium or dermoid, but not quite sure. The imaging features are suggestive, but there may be some focal or diffuse, hyperechoic component, there may be hyperechoic lines and dots, acoustic shadowing, there's no internal flow. Again, these, these are all sort of uh, more benignish findings, but you're not quite sure. So in these women, in a post-premenopausal woman, you'll get ultrasound at six to 12 weeks. And in a postmenopausal woman, you consider surgery. Now, findings, lesions with worrisome findings, such as thick septations, more than three millimeter, or irregular septations, solid nodules, especially with blood flow. Now, these lesions, you obviously consider surgery. So this is the summary of the SRU consensus statement. Now, ACR white paper basically took this and applied it to CT and MRI. So again, it has three determinants, morphology. Again, they define what is normal or find even findings that have been previously characterized or lesions that are stable for more than two years. Usually nothing needs to be done for this. Then there are four categories of lesions, benign appearing cyst, probably benign cyst, other adnexal masses, these are the most worrisome, and adnexal masses with characteristic features such as say dermoid. Then you consider the menstrual status. Is a woman premenopausal or early postmenopausal, that is within five years since last menstrual period, or less than 55 years of age, or late postmenopausal, that is more than five years since LMP, or 55 years of age or older. And then you add this size criteria. So again, we are going to build a similar table with first we'll talk about benign appearing cysts, probably benign cysts other imaging features or diagnostic imaging features. And within that, we'll consider within this, there is premenopausal, early postmenopausal, late postmenopausal, similar with probable benign cyst. And these are for any age. And then we'll consider lesion sites. So what are benign appearing cysts? These are the cysts that are usually less than 10 centimeter in size, round or oval, unilocular, uniform attenuation or signal, regular or imperceptible wall. There's no solid area, there's no, no nodules. Now for these lesions in a young woman, up to five centimeter, nothing needs to be done. 
After that, you get ultrasound at 6 to 12 weeks, hoping that the lesion would resolve. In early postmenopausal women, nothing needs to be done if the lesion is less than 3 cm in size. More than 3 cm, you get ultrasound evaluation either at 6 to 12 weeks or immediately. In a late postmenopausal woman, obviously you have a lower threshold, so you'll get ultrasound evaluation immediately. Now you'll notice for probably benign cyst, all these recommendations will just move leftward a little bit because we want to be more conservative. So what are these probably benign cysts? These are the lesions with features of benign cyst, except they may have angulated margins or they're not exactly round or oval or they may be poorly imaged portions of the lesion because of let's say streak artifacts in the pelvis or they may have reduced SNR because of technical reasons or because of unenhanced study. So for these for young women, up to 3 cm, nothing needs to be done. After that, you would evaluate the ultrasound, either after 6 to 12 weeks or for the larger lesions immediately. Early postmenopausal, again, up to 3 cm, you wouldn't do anything. After that, evaluate with ultrasound. And late postmenopausal women, obviously, we have higher index of suspicion, so you'll evaluate with ultrasound right away. Lesions with other imaging features. Now these are worrisome lesions. Lesions with solid component or mural nodule or septations, more than fluid attenuation, or in an older woman, layering hemorrhage. These are usually considered suspicious findings and for that, we'll recommend ultrasound. And diagnostic imaging features such as dermoid, when you know obviously the diagnosis, you'll just manage accordingly. So this is the summary of the ACR white paper. Now, just because we have these guidelines doesn't mean all problems are solved. Availability of guidelines does not ensure adherence to them. In our institution, only about 65% uh, patients or, or reports had adherence to the ACR white paper. Other studies are reported about 50% adherence rate. As a result, there's variability in the management, unwarranted patient anxiety. So we'll try to look into why there is, what are the barriers, why people don't follow these guidelines. And when we, we send out a survey to all the radiologists who practice abdominal and pelvic um, imaging, and the biggest reason was people not remembering the details of the guideline. And some people said, I don't have time to look up the guidelines. We have 10, 15, 20 cases on the queue, and people just don't want to Google, like search for the guideline and look up the paper. That basically, that's what people said. So these two causes accounted for 83% of the barriers. Some people did not agree with the guidelines and some people felt there's no need to use the guidelines, but those were minority. So we figured if we can fix these problems, we would have a major impact on the adherence rate. So we tried to create a clinical decision support. And what is CDS? It's basically key information, it's personalized, it's presented at appropriate times to enhance decisions at the point of care. That requires some kind of computable biomedical knowledge or evidence base, in this case, the guidelines, let's say. We need person-specific data. You need patient's age, the lesion type, lesion size, and some kind of algorithm or reasoning mechanism. And then that may take form of alerts, pop-ups, specific order sets, templates, or info buttons, depending on how you want to present it. So we essentially took this, and using this, we built educational material we told people that, look, we are not doing a great job on this. We need to improve this. And this is what we need to do. We created a PostScript template and also created an interactive CDS tool where you could just enter the information. It would just spit out the recommendation. But once people got familiar with this, they didn't really need this. The PostScript template itself was enough. And then we found once the, after the intervention, the baseline adherence rate went for, from 67% to 88%. So that was a significant change as shown by this SPC chart. Other places have shown something similar. At NYU Langone, they created this beautiful tool um, using collaboration between radiology and gynonc. It was again based on published guidelines. And even they found an increase in the adherence rate from 50 to 80%. So the idea is using this kind of clinical decision support, we can improve the adherence to the guidelines. So what is the take home message here? There's a need for efficient, consistent imaging strategies for evaluation of incidental ovarian lesions. We need to consider the cost-benefit ratio. Also look at the big picture. Like I said earlier, example of, patient, let's say, pancreatic cancer patient with advanced disease. You may not need this. But for most patients, having these guidelines helps standardize their evaluation. 
Evidence-based imaging should be judicious, consistent, and high yield. We should ideally have validated evidence-based guidelines. CDS can be an important intervention. It has shown to improve adherence at our institution and other institutions. And it's important for us radiologists to take care of this rather than referrals losing faith in our recommendations. Thank you.